Okay. Well, welcome everyone to today's session of the Soil and Nutrition Conference. Today we're welcoming um, Professor James White uh, to speak to us around the topic of rhizophagy, how plants and microbes work together um, to facilitate the uptake of nutrients in the soil and how those microbes cycle um, from the soil to the plants, how that whole cycle works. Um, James, it's such an honor to be able to introduce you and to listen to your presentation today. I've been um, just really enthralled with all of the information you've been sharing since 2018, since I heard your first talk with um, John Kempf. And I've, I believe any available talk presentation um, or podcast or, or anything you've put out, um, I've, I've tried to glean more information from. So I'm so looking forward to today and I will just give you the platform and uh, sit back and take notes. Thank you, Faith. Uh, that was a really nice introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, what I'm gonna, gonna do now is I'm gonna try to share the screen. Okay, okay, good. So uh, as Faith, mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the rhizophagy cycle. And this is actually a process where uh, plants are managing soil microbes. They attract soil microbes to their roots and they internalize them into the roots and they extract nutrients from them using reactive oxygen in the roots. And I'm going to talk about that process, but I'm also going to talk about endophytes in general and another process that's happening endophytes or, or plants are getting these microbes out of the soil and then they become endophytes in plants and then plants use them in various ways. So the first source for all of these microbes that go into plants uh, is the soil. These are soil microbes. That's why it's important to maintain healthy soils so that your plants can get these, these microbes that it needs to develop. And I'll show you how this whole process works in the roots, the rhizophagy cycle, uh, but I'll also show you how plants can obtain nutrients from these endophytes that are in the leaves also in trichomes in places that you don't think of, or essentially leaf hairs, you know, trichomes. Uh, endophytes are any microbes that go into plant. They, and the only important thing is they don't cause disease. And uh, you may have heard of endophytes with turf grasses. You've got a fungal endophyte in certain grasses or forage grasses. And uh, it, it's inside the tissues. You don't see it unless you have a microscope. And this actually shows an image of one of these fungal endophytes in a, in a grass plant. Endo meaning in, inside, phyte meaning plant. So any microbe really that goes inside a plant is an endophyte, fungi, bacterial, algal. Okay, but, but plants, all oh, plants have endophytes. There's not a single plant that doesn't have endophytes. It's not just in grasses, they're in every single plant that you can think of. And uh, these uh, endophytes will grow, particularly what's interesting to us is the ones that go inside the cells, inside the plant cells. So the plants will actually take these microbes and put into their cells and you can see it, see them in root hairs, you can see them in other root cells, but you can see them also on, on leaves and in leaf trichomes. But we're gonna talk about first this rhizophagy cycle and what's happening in the soil. And to see these endophytes, you have to have a microscope. And uh, beyond that, you also need to have certain stains. And a stain, I've listed some of these stains down below. Uh, uh, DAB, NBT, ammonium molybdate, aniline blue, acidified diphenylamine. Okay, those are some of the stains that we use to, uh, to visualize endophytes in plants. And uh, this first one, DAB, DAB is the main one. And uh, you'll see most, most of the images we've done with that one. Okay, here's a, a typical plant, a cactus. This is a cactus that occurs on the desert island of Bonaire in the Dutch Antilles. And that's one good thing about doing field work is I get to go to some interesting places to do, to do some work. And in fact, uh, when you love what you're doing, it's, it's indistinguishable to tell uh, work from vacation. 
And so uh, this, this work with, uh, on this uh, Bonaire, Bonaire really, uh, you can see that. Okay, these cacti are huge, they're all over the island, but uh, they, they have fruits way up, you see the fruits and take those seeds out like that and then germinate those seeds you get a seedling that looks like this. And this one actually was stained for hydrogen peroxide. It's a, a, a form of reactive oxygen with this VAB and you can see the kind of reddish brownish around the roots. That's because uh, wherever the microbes are, there's a lot of hydrogen peroxide uh, because of the way the plant interacts with that microbe. And so then because we use these, these hydrogen peroxide stains, we can see where the hydrogen peroxide is around these microbes and we can see the microbes better. This is a close up of some of those hairs and you can see here, uh, these are the root hairs. And you can see the dots in there. Those are loaded with bacteria, with dots, all, all, in, the, all in those hairs. These hairs become filled with, with microbes. Here's a, here's a hair, here's another hair. You can see the arrows now, the lower arrow, you can see kind of two little dots there. Those are where those bacteria have divided. So these bacteria are actively growing inside the plant. I like to think that the plant is uh, replicating these microbes because the plant is actively, actively involved in this process of cultivation of these microbes. And I'll show you what I mean by that uh, in the the rest of the process. The plant is very much in control of what it's doing with these microbes. This is not a pathogenicity. Plants take these microbes in from the soil. They don't take all microbes in, but they take some of them in from the soil and then they process them inside the root cells in this way. And uh, all plants have endophytes. And it, generally it's a community of endophytes in plants. So they are, uh, they have selected plants, select the community that helps them to grow the best. That's how we think about this process, obtaining the best nutrients and are they healthy under the, under the circumstances. Okay, what about crop plants? Okay, that cactus wasn't, wasn't a crop, it's wild. The crop plants, uh, all of them harbor endophytes. Here's one on one of my graduate students, April Michi, is trying to work on endophytes of cannabis. Of course, it's not quite legal here, so it's kind of hard to work on this right now. But we do have some people who are approved and so we can do a little bit of work on it. But uh, if you take the seed of cannabis, uh, it naturally carries endophytes on it. And in the seed, when you germinate that, take a look at it, you get, you get this, these are the root hairs off the root. And this is now stained for hydrogen peroxide. And you can see the little reddish brown in there. Those are bacteria inside that, inside that root hair. Look at the root hair to the right. You can see the spherical, large spherical structures and smaller spherical structures in there. These are the bacteria that have been internalized into those root cells. Uh, so uh, this is a very much an active, uh, active process of getting these microbes out of the soil that plants are engaged in. This is how plants get their nutrients naturally rather than putting uh, nitrogen, for example, or inorganic forms of, of nitrogen or other kinds of nutrients onto the soils. So this is how plants naturally get their nutrients. They get it from microbes. They get it from microbes. And that's the importance of having a living, healthy soil. Here's, a, here's another plant that has endophytes. This is tomato. You think of a, a you cut open a tomato, you think, oh, those are 100% pure, clean, sterile inside. And a lot of people thought that. But if you take these seeds out and germinate them, and you can actually isolate endophytes out of the seedlings, even if you sterilized them a good amount. This is one of the endophytes that come out. This is a one called micrococcus, and it produces these tetrads or little clusters of four bacteria together. And we like this one because we could take this one, kind of like our, 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 our uh, guinea pig, microbe guinea pig, because we could take it, we could put it in a plant and It'll, it'll retain its microbial, its tetrad forms until the superoxide oxidizes those off, those walls off, and then they'll form these little protoplasts. And so we can track it in the plant at their various stages and see the transformations that happen with this microbe. And um, so this is actually tomato root now. You can see the root hairs over here to the left and you can see the tip over here to the right. And you see this orange area 
uh, this orange, large orange area, microbial entry zone, the bacteria are going in there. They're going in there and secreting ethylene. And, and we can see that ethylene coming up as this purple or orange kind of stain. Well, they also go at the tip and this purple out there, that's, they're also entering right there at the tip at the, so they're entering two places in these roots. They're coming from the soul, being attracted to this area and they're going into the cells there. And I'll show you more of that. So this is that uh, micrococcus, that tetrad. And you can see this was, in this case, we put it inside a Rumex crispus, a curly dock. And you can see the cells here. And you can see the, the big cells, those are the root cells. And you can see the little blue particle cells. Those are the, the bacteria in their tetrad shapes. And so they have their walls on them, cell walls on them, and then they form in these tetrads and you can see them. So when they first go into the root, at the root tip, they will have their walls on them. After that, the, the plant will detect their presence and secrete superoxide on them, which will oxidize off the cell walls and start to extract nutrients from the, from the microbes. So the plant is extracting nutrients from microbes using superoxide that it produces in response to presence of the, of the endophyte. I'll, I'll go into more of that. You can see the bacteria in the cells here. This is just so that you can see for yourself these tetrad forms, little square tetrad forms of bacteria that have been internalized into the, into the, root, to the root cells. Okay, so I just want you to have a good clear image of that so you see the bacteria going in. Well, okay. The, these microbes are from the soil. So they all come at some point from the soil uh, that the roots take out of the soil. Uh, but the best microbes the plant will put on its seeds and you'll see them on seeds and also use them in other parts of the plant. Use them, for example, in the trichomes that we'll talk about later. But right now we're talking about rhizophagy cycle. And uh, this is not something that we invented in my lab. Uh, we were on a separate, really a, a, a track working on these plant microbes, bacterial endophytes, uh, when the paper came out where someone actually described these intracellular endophytes. And uh, uh, this was actually, the, in, the discoverers were a group in, in Queensland, Australia. This is one of them. Chani Pong Fu, Dr. Pong Fu. Uh, and uh, this is their work. What they did is they took yeast, and they took bacteria, they labeled them with GFP so they could track them in plants and they fed them tomato and they fed them to rabbitopsis and they tracked them in the tissue to see where they were. And what they found is, uh, if you look here to the left image, E over here, all the way at the bottom, you see a root hair, you see those little red or little green dots in there. If those are yeasts that have been stained with GFP. That was their stain. They tagged it with green fluorescent protein. So it would fluoresce when they looked at it. And so now you can see that those bacteria that they tagged went inside those hairs. You see them in these other pictures as well at, at B and D, all those little dots in there. All the bacteria that they labeled and fed into tomato or rabidopsis. I'm not sure which one that is. But it went into both. They these investigators later called this rhizophagy, 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 rhizophagy for rhizo root, phagy for eating, root eating. And, uh, you know, we, in my lab, we ex expanded on this, try to figure out what was going on here, and we, put, we filled a bunch of details in. And what we figured out is that it's actually is kind of cyclic, this process, and we called it the rhizophagy cycle. And that is that what's happening is microbes are in the soil are being attracted to the roots because the roots are secreting exudates. These are sugars and organic acids, and in some cases, amino acids, so that the, the microbes are able to find the plant. And then once they are find the plant, the, they are internalized into root cells at the root tip, at the epidermis area. And uh, we don't exactly know how that internalization occurs. I mean, this is simply an area of unknown there. We do know that they go in because we can see them going in. We can track them in. We know we can, we can see what happens. And we're right now we're left to uh, speculate about you know uh, 
what is the process, for example, is it endocytosis, is it, is it phagocytosis where the plant cell just engulfs it, engulfs the microbe and takes it in, or is it some other process, for example, where the microbe is, uses its own digestive enzymes to get into the cell wall and then once in there, they're trapped. We don't exactly know. We do know once they get in though, they can't get out. And what happens once they're inside these cells is they're hit with superoxide. And that superoxide will digest the cell walls off of the microbes. So losing their cell walls, whatever nutrients were on those cell walls, like proteins, for example, go straight to the plant. They can absorb that. Uh, and any other metals that were on those cell walls and microbes. And also some of these microbes completely degraded. So whatever nutrients they had in them, uh, for example, potassium, which may have been in the cytoplasm, then goes straight into the, to the plant. So the plant can get a lot of nutrients from these microbes in the rise of BG cycle. Uh, and, they, and they do that. This happens all the time. All plants are doing this. Uh, and uh, we can make it where it doesn't work as well by putting nitrogen on it, which paralyzes the process. Or we could favor the process in some other ways, putting up other kind of organic nutrients or other other nutrients that plants can get to. So what happens is uh, the, the microbes are extracted of nutrients using superoxide, then they accumulate, surviving microbes will accumulate in these root hair initials. And then they will trigger root hairs to grow. We know because without microbes there, we have no root hair elongation. Those microbes trigger root hair elongation. And then as the hairs elongate, those microbes are ejected out of the tips of the hairs back into the soil. And you can see these arrows coming out of my hairs here. That's every time that a hair grows, it ejects some of those microbes that go to the soil. They then re reform their cell walls and their cell shapes and go out of acquire nutrients later to be attracted back to the, to, the, to the plant. We don't know a lot of details about this. You know, which particular microbes are involved in giving nutrients, which ones are fully degraded, we don't know. Which ones are problematic if they go into the cells? Because there are some that could be problematic and the plant doesn't manage them as well. We've seen some of those experiments. But so there's a whole range of possibilities here for these microbes. And uh, what we do know is that the rise of the CG cycle happens, microbes go in it, and plants get nutrients as a result of it. They, plants with more root tips would get more nutrients from rhizophagy cycle. And the reason for that is that uh, the rhizophagy cycle is a phenomenon of root tips. And the more root tips you have, the more nutrients plants can get from this process. And this is a grass root. Grasses in particular have a lot of root tips, a lot of root branching. And on all these many, many tips, rhizophagy cycle would be happening. So a grass plant like corn could be doing a lot of rhizophagy cycle in those, in those roots, would be doing a lot. Okay, so this shows a grass root. This is actually a Phragmites, one of our experimental plants that we work on. It's a root. You can see that this is the exudate zone. That's blue cloud out here. These are all the microbes that these roots are attracting to them. And they're absorb, absorbing them into the cells right at this, <coughs> right at the epidermal layer at the tip <coughs> of, that, of that root. <coughs> Excuse me. This is what they look like inside the cell. Now, this is a root epidermis cell. <coughs> this is of Phragmites again. And you can see these black arrows, they're showing the bacteria inside. And you can see they're replicating in there. They are replicating inside that cell. The smallest ones are the youngest ones. The oldest ones are the biggest ones. <coughs> and I use two stains here. One is the brown for superoxide, <coughs> or rather for hydrogen peroxide. The other one is aniline blue and, and blue. And if you notice this lower arrow, that smallest cell is blue. That's because of protein. That's a protein stain, the aniline blue. And so where there's more protein in those cells, you see those staining bluer. So what's happening is these, these cells, as they, oh, as they age, they're being 
penetrated by this superoxide, which goes right through the membrane and will break down proteins inside those, inside those cells. So inside those bacterial cells. So there's proteins being degraded. And so that's one, one source of nitrogen for the, for the plant is degradation or oxidation of these microbial proteins that would then form, uh, or even larger molecules. Uh, we know that plants can absorb breakdown products from, from, from proteins and from other kind of DNA molecules and so forth. So larger molecules could be absorbed using this same system. <clears throat> so these microbes actually, they're not in the cell proper, uh, that is they're not in the cytoplasm instead, they go, these bacteria go underneath the cell wall, this gray area here is the cell wall. And you can see the central area here, I'm, I'm showing uh, that's the cytoplasm of the root cell. They're not actually in that, they're outside that plasma membrane, just underneath the cell wall. So they're in this space called the periplasmic space. So the, the plant can detect when those microbes are in that periplasmic space. And I'll tell you the, take home now is that they, they can detect them because these microbes are producing ethylene. And so they can detect that ethylene and then, and then they will actually respond by secreting superoxide. And that's just two zero minus, the zero minus out here, that's the superoxide, superoxide that's being produced and put on those microbes. <clears throat> and at the same time, the plant is managing these microbes. It's moving them around in the cell, okay, in a process called cyclosis. Cyclosis, C L Y C L O S I S. Cyclosis. That just means cell movement, and I'll show you how that happens. But it's important because this is how the plant is managing these microbes, keeping them off their toes, mixing their their nutrients up, encouraging them to moving them around like that, encouraging them to divide and so forth, replicating them. So this is. This is very much part of this uh, manipulation process or farming, I like to call it farming, where plants are farming microbes. This is a farming process. Uh, this actually is the enzyme that the plant uses to produce superoxide. And it's one called uh, uh, NADPH uh, oxidase enzyme, or sometimes called NOx enzymes. And if you're familiar with the, like the way aspirins work, they usually work on on certain of these, certain of these uh, reactive oxygen enzymes. So this is one of those at, that plants have. And it, this enzyme will take molecular oxygen from the atmosphere and it will produce superoxide. And then that superoxide will use to get nutrients out of the microbes and to control the microbes inside the cells, inside the root cells. Well, um, <clears throat> this, uh, uh, because superoxide, I almost forgot what I was going to say. Because superoxide uh, is necessary for rhizophagy cycle, if plants don't have oxygen uh, in the soil, they don't have good aeration, they cannot use this enzyme to produce superoxide because it takes molecular oxygen and will convert it into superoxide in this pro using this enzyme. And so if you, you have poor aeration in the soil, uh, say you've got a hard pan or some other problem causing flooding or just air, non good airflow, too much lack of oxygen in the soil, uh, plants are not going to grow well because they need that oxygen in order to produce superoxide in order to extract nutrients from the microbes. So you right away, you're going to reduce nutrient extraction if you don't have good airflow in the soil. Well, plants will hit those bacteria with superoxide and that will cause the bacteria that have their wall, walled shapes like these over here to the left, this is a bacillus rod, you can see the wall sh wall, rod shapes. But once superoxide oxidizes off those cell walls, instead you get these spherical structures shown here to the right. These are, these are the protoplast bacterial protoplast phages, phases. Fungi will do it too. Certain yeasts will go in and they also hit with superoxide. They will lose their cell walls as, as well and form these, these uh, protoplast phases. In bacteria, they call these L forms. They're just wallless bacteria. In fungi, they call them, uh, uh, I forgot, 
was just there just a second ago. Uh, Michael, mycoplasts, I think, uh, or something similar. They're just little naked protoplast fungal phases, and uh, they're basically the same, you know, between fungi. And so fungi can use bacteria to get nutrients. They could also, I mean, plants can use bacteria to get nutrients. Nutrients they can also use fungi, but. Uh, they're important for more than just obtaining nutrients because the plant development depends on presence of these microbes in the root cells. And that is the microbes in the root cells will tr trigger the gravitropic response. The gravitropic response is when you have roots that go down with gravity. We take all the microbes off of plants, off the of seedlings, the seedling roots stay on the surface so sometimes they just go in the air. So it's necessary to have the gravitropic response to have the mic microbes there. Uh, also, root hair elongation. If you have no microbes on a seedling, you have no root hairs forming. You may have root cells growing, uh, but you don't have bacteria in the root cells in order to trigger root hair elongation. Okay, and so microbes development in plants is closely tied to the presence of microbes in plants. And uh, the reason is, part of the reason is because the microbes, besides providing nutrients, the microbes are also providing growth hormone, ethylene, at least one that we've been experimenting, we found. Ethylene, it's an important growth hormone that triggers elongation of growth in cells. And uh, okay, so this is actually a Bermuda grass in which we removed all the microbes from it. And you can see you have a nice root there, uh, but there's no hairs on that root, okay? When we take the, in that same experiment, we then take a, a microbe, an endophyte that we have off of our Phragmites, put it on this Bermuda grass. Now, then you see what happens right away. Now we put a, in this, kit, in this grass, we put a, is a root here. We put a, a, a the Pseudomonas bacterium on it, and you can see right away. You see hair formation right away, and uh, hairs form right away on this with the bacterium. Okay, this shows a bit later on. You can see all the this, oops, go there. You can see the hairs, all the brown in there, the stain for hydrogen peroxide. All that brown is uh, bacteria in there, and if you look at the root itself, little brown dots, those are bacteria inside there. These roots are filled with bacteria. They're filled with bacteria. This shows one of these root hairs. You can see all the little spherical. Those are the protoplast phases inside there. That's a pseudomonad. So that's pseudomonas bacterium, common soil bacterium, common plant bacterium. Okay, tomato. Tomato seeds have bacteria inside them. And uh, it's actually tricky to kill. They have some on the surface, but they have some inside them. It's tricky to kill them, but you can if you're very careful with antibiotics. This actually shows one of these experiments. This is a tomato with no antibiotic treatment. You can see the seedling there. You can see the hairs coming out. Same age now, same age, but treated with streptomycin. Okay, in, a, in, a, uh, in the seedling stage, uh, and you see there's no hair formation now. We didn't it negatively impact the growth as far as we could tell of the seedling, uh, but we uh, killed the bacteria or inhibited the bacteria and you have no hair formation, no elongation. Okay, this just shows this, this shows a hair uh, in which we removed all the bacteria. You can see they formed these hair initials called tro trichoblasts, actually trichoblast. And you can see in there, there's nothing inside there. You don't see any bacteria in there. Whereas over here at A, okay, we have our bacteria still on this tomato. And you can see the little brown dots in there. Those are the bacteria in that trichoblast. And you see as it elongates, you can see the bacteria concentrate at the tip. Now they stay at that tip uh, and, uh, and hairs elongate. You can see here a bit older, you can see the microbes over here, all that brown uh, in that tip of that hair. Uh, Many bacteria go into a cell, a root cell at the tip, but certain ones are replicated. And those ones that are replicated 
are produced in massive numbers as they go out of these of these root cells, root hairs at the tip. Uh, and I'll explain that. But but the soil essentially, the plant essentially repopulates the soil with these microbes that work with it well in the rhizophagy cycle. So these are the ones that go increase in concentration. And why is there this linkage between growth and hair formation? And the, my graduate student, this is Ivy Chang, who's working on this, but she's looking at the, uh, what is it that, how do the, the, the new bacteria cause plants, plant root hairs to grow and uh, what stimulates root growth in general having to do with these microbes. And uh, here you can see a grass without microbes. You can see there's no hairs on that to sustain for sustain for hydrogen peroxide, but there's no hairs there. And you can see here to the right where she put the microbe on it. This is a pseudomonad again. She put it on, you can see the hairs right away forming on that. So ethylene is what we found is being produced by these microbes. And uh, all of our all of our data, we did many experiments to support that. Ethylene is also a growth hormone. It, it, it's a plant hormone that plants will use to trigger growth and maturation in fruits. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's also something that these microbes are producing, the ethylene. Uh, and they're able, to, they're able to use that, trigger the, grow, plant, the, the roots, plant roots to grow and then the microbes can get nutrients when those cells are growing. Okay, so we figured out that this is actually the interaction, the chemical interaction. This is one of two important chemical interactions that's happening between the microbes and the, and the plants, intracellular microbes. And this, I'll just show you just a few of these, just so you see what I'm talking about. Uh, okay, one reactant is ethylene. The microbes are producing ethylene and the plant then in response to that ethylene production will release sugars to the microbe, but also releases superoxide. That, and that superoxide then will combine with the ethylene and will form nitrogen peroxide. And so when we stain with that nitrogen peroxide stain, we're able to see the bacteria because the hydrogen peroxide is all around this bacteria, the, being the product of that ethylene superoxide combination. But of course, it's that superoxide that extracts nutrients from those bacteria. So uh, that is, you know, but that's a part of that interaction. They enter in this area. And we'll look a close up of some. Okay, so this is actually from the tip. Here you can see this is one of these root cap cells that have peeled off and you can see the bacteria in here. This is stained for ethylene now using an ethylene stain that makes it, uh, makes it purple where there's ethylene. You can see the purple around these, these spherical structures. That's the ethylene being secreted by those, by those microbes. This is, shows the root itself and you can see the microbes on the outside. That's where they're penetrating in right there into the, into the root cells, and this is a close-up now. You can see, this is the root cell. You can see this, the spherical structure inside of this arrow. That's the microbe in there. You can see the purple around it. That's ethylene that the microbe is producing. And the, uh, these are actually in little pits, so you understand the relationship. This is in a, this, this microbe is pressed into almost like a foxhole-like depression on the surface of the plasma membrane. So the, the bacterium is, is very close to the plasma membrane of the root cell. So they're just right up against one another. The membrane, membrane connection, the walls are gone that separated the bacteria and the plant. They have only their membranes now and they're interacting chemically inside that plant. This shows superoxide. That's a, one of the. One, that's what the plant is producing to extract nutrients from the microbes. And all this blue actually is the superoxide there. We use NBT to visualize that. This shows this another hair. And you can just stain for hydrogen peroxide. You can see all the brown around those bacteria in that hair. And this is probably not one species, by the way. This one is from nature, so uh, it's probably multiple species of bacteria in there. There's another reaction that's important. And uh, uh, 
And it, it, it happens to be this reaction here. And in this reaction, what happens is the microbe secretes an antioxidant, but that antioxidant is nitric oxide. It's a potent antioxidant and it will combine, it will, in order to protect itself, the microbe secretes this nitric oxide and it will combine with superoxide and will form nitrate. <coughs> and that nitrate can then be absorbed using nitrate transporters. Uh, so, um, and, and in this reaction, what happens is the, the plant, I mean, the microbe uh, is essentially providing nitrogen to the, to the plant in order to protect itself from that superoxide. Uh, at least that's how, the, that's how we hypothesize this. And we can measure all of these components in plants. And because uh, this, is, this, is this is a root hair of, of a cabbage, it's like, and you can see the bacteria there, and you can see the purple around it that shows the, the nitrate, and that's stained for nitrate. And with this nitrate stain, that stained purple where there's nitrate, you can see them around all of those, or the purple around all of that. So they're all secreting nitrate into the, into the plant. That's how we interpret that. Uh, this, these interactions, when taken together, uh, represent a kind of a trap for these microbes. Again, the plant is in control of this process. Because what happens is, if the microbes in here, uh, if they secrete ethylene, they get sugar, this carbon, they get those nutrients. If they stop secreting ethylene, they don't get it. They don't get nutrients and they starve and growth ceases and they, don't, they can't replicate. Uh, so they can't stop that ethylene secretion. Uh, in terms of nitrogen, uh, if they stop secreting nitric oxide, what will happen is the superoxide will damage them. That, that will oxidize the cells and then they will break down. So they have to keep secreting this nitrogen, this nitric oxide in order to counteract superoxide plant produce superoxide. So this, this forces them to keep fixing nitrogen if, uh, under cert, cert, whatever circumstances possible and then transfer that, use that nitrogen to make uh, nitric oxide. Okay, so you have these loops and the microbes cannot exit from either of these loops. Uh, they're only when they're injected can they get out of these, these hairs. And uh, it is, we think that uh, there could be some nitrogen fixation occurring in these hairs. Uh, if, if so, it could be uh, at the sides of the hairs where uh, there's very little reactive oxygen around these hairs because we've got microbes being replicated around the length of the hair. And also we have, uh, we have less superoxide there and uh, so that those microbes can potentially fix nitrogen. Okay, so uh, in that process, cyclosis, in the process of rhizophagy cyclosis, cyclosis is very important. That cytoplasm is strange. This is one of the plants on that desert island, Bonaire, grows in the rocks without any, uh, without really much soil. This is a root hair now, looking at a root hair under the microscope. You can see the movement. That's what cyclosis is happening. Actually, if you look below, you'll see one of these root hairs, and you can see the bacteria in it. The brown areas are stained, that's stained for hydrogen peroxide around those bacteria. You can see the bacteria in there, but now the one above shows them living and they are moving. This is what actually happens. They're constantly moving. The plant is moving them around, replicating them, getting increasing numbers of the microbes, uh, exposing some under certain circumstances to superoxide and getting nutrients, getting nutrients out again. Most of the superoxide exposure happens to be at the tips though, rather than on the sides. Okay, so uh, we'll look at that. Okay, so this is actually showing one of those root hairs again from the, that sedge. And you can see there's a lot of bacteria here. Those probably originated from one single bacterium. You can see the biggest are the oldest ones. The oldest ones are, the biggest ones are probably the oldest ones and the smallest ones here are probably the youngest ones. So you have this replication happening. And when that replication is happening, cells, uh, cells can fix nitrogen and build up their content, nitrogen contents through nitrogen fixation from the air. 
uh, but inside the inside the plant, when superoxide really comes down on these molecules, it's going to break down into that nitrogen that's built up. This shows one of these sedge root hairs again. You can see the whole thing through a top of the bacteria going around in psychosis. And you see they're accumulating at the tip. So they're actually accumulating there. And as those concentration builds up uh, at the tip, they would, these microbes produce more ethylene. And that would then cause the, a growth spurt to happen. And microbes then, uh, the root hair would grow and some of those microbes would eject out. I'll show you that. This, by the way, uh, it, you can actually see these moving in the microscope. So you could look in the reverse of the plate and you can see the psychosis happening. This is what, how root hairs really work. It's not the static things that we think of that just absorb chemicals. They're manipulating microbes, they're managing microbes. Okay, so let me see if I can go to the next. Oops. So this is what ejection looks like. This is one of these hairs. You can see the bacteria outside it and you can see bacteria inside it. These hairs become fat with bacteria, fat with bacteria. They're, they become engorged. You can see how fat this is on the end. And these, some of these bacteria aren't stained. You see some red ones in here, but there are some that didn't pick up stain at all. And they're, they're, they're out there outside. And internally, these hairs are fat with microbes, literally fat. And uh, the ejection of microbes corresponds ex exactly to growth spurts in the hairs. Um, this shows uh, one of the hairs. You can see the microbes out. You can see kind of a transition bacterial protoplast that were kind of in that wall that's coming out. Little pores form in the growing wall. And it's through those pores that these microbes get expelled. And this shows actually the way the tip works. This uh, is something we call the psychosis expansion wave hypothesis for microbe expansion from root hairs. And what you have is, this diagram to the left here will show the psychosis of microbes going around and around. You can see they're being deposited here in this more flexible tip of the hair here, of the wall here. It goes in there and the tip of the hair itself really is a little needle shaped structure. So it's skinny little thing inside that. But the microbes accumulate around here. And then at some point, there's an expansion wave. We think when ethylene builds up to the point that it, it, it triggers this expansion, this growth wave it happens at the base of the hair, it goes to the tip and, and, and essentially squeezes those microbes out of pores in the tip. And I'll show you, I'll show you that. Okay, this shows a hair uh, of, a, of a Bermuda grass where we saw that, those periodic ejections. So at each place here, you would have seen an ejection. And instead what happened here is some of these microbes were left inside the wall. So they remained on the inside rather than being ejected. So you have those that remain there. Others were ejected. This is actually, this endophyte comes from another plant. So it wasn't adapted to this Bermuda grass. And so that's why it probably doesn't work perfectly when it goes in to Bermuda grass. But this shows these steps in ejection. Uh, you can see the, the red here shows where uh, microbes are producing ethylene and being exposed to superoxide right there. That causes the, the, the uh, plants to secrete more nitric oxide and uh, then that forms nitrate to control some of that, that superoxide. And, and then the, that, the ethylene that was produced triggers a cell growth event. Uh, in elongation. And as that happens, that growth spurt happens, those microbes are shot out. And then the remaining microbes that are in there that were on the sides and were not ejected, then are replicated. And they can be replicated inside during psychosis when reactive oxygen is minimized and they can replicate those microbes. And then, uh, then it's ready again. It builds up and you have another growth spurt. We estimated that that is about a 15 second, at least in Bermuda grass, a 15, a 15 minute interval, 15 minutes. And then there's another growth spurt, 15 more minutes, another growth spurt, 
and so forth. But that number is a very, you know, highly variable. It's an estimated number. I mean, we could be talking about an, an hour or two hours variability in, in, depending on the plant. We, we really don't know a whole lot about it. Uh, this is a tomato root here. And you can see the bacteria from these tomato root hairs actually being ejected through the through the pores at the tip of that hair. You can see there, there's some, like three little pores on number three there. Looks like they're going out of those. You can see some over here too. Hard to see the pores in number two. But this is what this ejection looks like of bacteria coming out of these hairs. So once they're ejected, they would then go out, acquire more nutrients, reform their cell walls, acquire more nutrients, and attract you back to the rise of the cell. So we did a number of experiments to evaluate what nutrients come with. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, this is done by uh, uh, a visiting scientist, Dr. Xiao, uh, who took wheat, removed all the microbes off of wheat, and then put back onto the wheat one at a time, the microbes, and then measured the nutrients, measured the effect on the plants, and also measured the nutrients that went into plants with and without the microbes. And basically, we clean, he cleaned the microbes using Clorox to, and, uh, and uh, antibiotic to, to uh, clean it afterwards. This shows the plants. This is the control, the sterile control versus the plant in which we replaced a bacteria, bacterial endophyte, it happens to be a bacillus. You can see how tiny the roots are in the controls without bacteria, without endophytes. And over here, the huge with endophytes. You can see how the, the roots are much bigger, the shoots are much bigger. We really see it in root growth when you remove endophytes. So roots really do require these microbes in them in order to grow bigger. And, uh, and, and better, I and mean, that's just a crude effect. You see it all bigger. Nitrogen, this is terms of nitrogen. Now this is, he measured, he took the leaves of the plant and then measured and shoots, measured the nitrogen that was in, in, in that tissue. And uh, here you see with no bacteria, it came up to this bar that much. And then with these bacteria, there were three different bacteria that he used. And, and you can see it, it, it increased it by about 30%. And that's about like, that appears to be like what the rhizophagy cycle is worth in terms of nitrogen. It looks like it's about 30% coming into plants from the rhizophagy cycle, 33%, something like that. It may vary depending on the plant, depending on what the plant is doing. So it's not a, not a hard, fast, rule, we've seen it highly variable in other plants. Okay, here is phosphorus, you can see with the bacteria versus without, looks like about 20% more, and those seem to be about equal, there's different bacteria. Here's with potassium, look at potassium. That first bacterium, it looks like triple the amount that you had in the no bacterial controls. So that one bacterium really benefited the plant in terms of bacterium. The plant may be, you know, I don't know, there may be a, uh, an intermedium, a, a medium, a uh, uh, happy medium in terms of breakdown of the microbe and the amount of nutrient that comes out of it and, and survival and so forth. But it looks like this particular bacterium, however it's working, is bringing a lot of potassium. And potassium, you would expect to come out of the cytoplasm because uh, it's uh, one of the solutes in the cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm is full of potassium. So plants could get a lot of potassium from cytoplasm with these microbes. Okay, you look at these others uh, in terms of potassium, and it looks like they're like double that control, but they're still not as good. Take home messages that every microbe is different in terms of nutrients. They're all different. They affect different, different nutrients. Most nutrients are impacted, some more than others, but most of them are impacted in the rise of the cycle. Uh, okay, here we see calcium. We see the same deal there. Calcium looks like you know, it's like uh, any of those bacteria are, are, are they're nearly equal in terms of benefits, in terms of calcium, that they benefit. Magnesium, same deal. Zinc, looks like that second one is really good with zinc again. And uh, so, so that's rhizophagy cycle. And rhizophagy cycle, 
is getting nutrients out of plants, kind of in a kind of out of soil, out of a bulk kind of soil environment, bringing all those nutrients. But there's other benefits that endophytes have in plants, and, and this has to do with the nitrogen fixation phenomenon. And uh, this is something new that I have not spoken uh, much about, uh, and it's just a new era for us. We're looking at trichomes and uh, we hypothesize that these trichomes, well, they all appear to contain endophytic bacteria. We hypothesize that they in fact are nitrogen fixation structures. And I'll, I'll go and explain the reasons that I think that, but these are trichomes or plant hairs. All plants have some kinds of trichomes, some kinds of plant hairs, at least most of them do. And they're variable and people don't really understand what these trichomes have been for. They're not just tools for separating plants taxonomically or little ornamentations on plants, but we maintain their functional structures that are, that are microbiome related. They're, they they function, it appears to us in experiments so far, to provide nitrogen, to get nitrogen out of the air. You know, there are structures on leaves or on fruits, they're sticking in the air. And there's a big need for nitrogen in those structures that bear these trichomes. And so they would seem to be structures that are adapted for this is what we're working hypothesis we're working on now. And those two reactions that I described from root hairs, they're very important in leaf hairs and fruit hairs and trichomes. These work in the air, not, in, not only in the soil air, but now in the air above the plant. And you can see this is the second interaction, or it's the first interaction, ethylene and superoxide, you have superoxide. So all of that, we think those interactions are happening. I'll show you the reasons why we think they're happening because we stay for them and we can see them. Now, the, the plant, or the, rather the endophyte, secretes nitric oxide again as the source of nitrogen uh, to protect itself from the plant's superoxide. It's making that nitrogen, that's combining, you're getting nitrate. Uh, so those two reactions are important. We've looked at eight or so, uh, this list, however many, eight or so species or nine species of plants that have trichomes in several families, including Aceraceae, including Cannabaceae, the cannabis, cannabis, right? Beans, Solanaceae, Malvaceae, Scrofulariaceae, a lot of plants. Those trichomes are, different kinds, there's dendroid trichomes, there's filamentous trichomes, there's glandular trichomes. Okay, and we're gonna, I'm gonna, gonna look at each one of those and just show you what, what we have on, on those. But uh, we stained all of these types of trichomes for all of those chemicals that I talked about before that have to do with the two equations in plants. And you can see all these checks show where we where we did a test and we found that, that those chemicals are producing, are present. Like uh, ethylene, for example, in this Ailanthus altissima, this is tree of heaven, uh, you can see that ethylene is produced by three different tests we measured, three different stains, histochemical tests. Superoxide, you can see superoxide is there and so forth. You get the, you get the you get the point of this table. Uh, and this is one of the plants that we looked at that we have a little bit more data on. This is one called Portia tree, Thespasia papomia. It's a tropical tree, it grows all around beaches and in very non fertile areas. This is my graduate student, Dr. Eva Lisa Rizari, who worked on that. And this is a, one of these developing leaves of Portia tree. You can see the little glandular trichomes, actually, the the top arrow shows a glandular trichome. And I think these glandular trichomes will, will grow into these bigger ones. Sometimes at least they'll grow into the bigger ones. Uh, but, but if you look closely at those, okay, like here, looking at the arrows, this is one of these uh, Portia tree glandular trichomes. You can see the little spherical structures there. And you see the purple around it. The purple is the ethylene being produced inside in various places inside. This is developing, this is developing hair. This is a fully mature Portia tree hair. They form these peltate trichomes, little like umbrella-like structures. And you can see the little arms of this here. You can see the little brown in there. 
those are the bacteria that are inside these hairs. It's stained for nitric oxide, and, and it shows the nitric oxide produced by all those bacteria. Here's one of those hairs. You can see where it's collapsed, and you can see the bacteria now uh, coming on. I think this is also nitric oxide around these bacteria coming out of the squished from the from the cell. So uh, the question is, you know, while we can see these chemical interactions there, does that really mean that these microbes are, that plants are benefiting by nitrogen that's being fixed by these bacteria that are inside the trichomes? And uh, uh, to answer that, we did some 15 in tracking experiments. This is just one of them. Uh, but basically in these experiments, you expose plant to isotopic nitrogen, that's 15 N2 basically, because most of the air is comprised of uh, uh, nitrogen that's 14 N2 with a lower ratio of 15 N isotope in it. So when we beef up the 15 N isotope in a chamber with these plants, if they're fixing nitrogen, if they're taking that gas, that 15 N, into out of the air and they're putting it into proteins or ammonia, whatever they're putting it into, uh, we should be able to, to pick it up in by analyzing the plant for 15 in isotope and compare that to what we get in the air and we'll see how much assimilation is happening. So that's what these experiments are about. And so you see these chambers, one with air, one with the N2 in it, you let the plant stay in there for five, six days, seven days, then take the plants out dry them up, analyze them for 15N versus 14N ratio, and you get your, your answer about whether or not nitrogen fixation is happening in those tissues. So this is actually diagrams uh, that shows uh, plantlets, the uh, Porsche tree plantlet. You can see younger leaves right there, the little hearts, and you see the older leaves down below. And if you look at the big numbers, actually, you can see these younger leaves, like the old plant one, you can see there are six, Two, three point three four, and that's a figure delta fifteen n versus air. It's a meaning it, it that's a big number with respect to how much nitrogen fifteen was absorbed compared to the roots themselves. If you look down at roots, you see the number is much less than into those, and and that goes down as the tissues age. If you look here, get the plant two, you get seven fifty five at this 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 measurement here. Then you see all the rest of them are are down, go down, down to 200, down to 84 in some of the roots. Uh, so you see a lot of fixation is happening on these developing structures, these developing leaves. And in fact, it's in these developing leaves where we have the highest concentration of these um, uh, glandular trichomes. And so there's a correlation with nitrogen assimilation into plants and presence and density of those trichomes. Here's another plant that we looked at. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, cannabis hemp. Hemp. Uh, uh, it's legal in New Jersey, but it's still hard to do re research on it, believe it or not. Uh, but these are the and hemp has these glandular trichomes that most of you are probably familiar with. This just shows these developing. Some of these are on a stalk, and the heads are here at the top. So it turns out the microbes are in these heads, by the way. They're in the heads, and I'll show you. This shows these glandular trichomes from the side. You can see the stalk it has. You can also notice the stalk is a little bit green. That's because the stalk has chloroplasts in it. And it's the chloroplasts in this stalk that provide the sugar that drives activities, including nitrogen fixation activities. So we hypothesize inside these trichome, glandular trichomes, there's no chlor chlorophyll in these glandular trichome heads. Uh, if there were chlorophyll, then we would be generating oxygen, a lot of extra oxygen, that extra oxygen would inhibit nitrogen fixation happening in those. And, uh, and the, the chlorophyll below, of course, that's necessary because nitrogen fixation is an energy demanding process and it requires a lot of nutrients. So these stocks have to feed that head in terms of sugars to, to fix for nitrogen fixation. This is one of these developing glandular trichomes and you can see the 
arrows around the periphery say, those are the bacteria. This is stained for uh, NBT superoxide. So the purple around there is superoxide that the plant is producing onto those microbes. And if you look closer at it, you can see here's a bit closer up. And you can see actually now, looking at the left over here, you can see some of these are in the rod forms. These are early on. This is in the rod form. What will happen is the superoxide will oxidize off these bacterial cell walls and they'll form their protoplast bases. But now in trichomes, glandular trichomes, rather than in root hairs like we talked about before. Now the similar process is happening in trichomes. This shows actually one of these uh, glandular trichomes looking down at it. Uh, there's a leaf below, but this is the periphery of the trichome. You can see the wall of the trichome is out here and you see all this brown in here. That is all bacteria, bacterial protoplasts inside your trichome. And uh, so that's all area out there that has microbes in it that could be fixing nitrogen. So this would be the nitrogen fixation area out there. Whereas now you look at this, here's in the center, we have our trichome cells, several of them. I heard that's eight. It looks exactly like eight, two, isn't that? Two, three, four, one, two, three, four, we've got eight, eight cells. And you can see where it interfaces with these bacteria now. Now you can see the interface where it's blue. That's the, this is stained for superoxide. So it's used in that NBT stain that shows blue. And you can see here in this area where it's staining, the cells actually look like they maybe get maybe a little bigger, like they're swelling, because that's what you would expect to happen as the cell walls get oxidized off and the cells swell a little bit. But this would be the nitrogen transfer zone right in here, interfacing with that cell with that with those bacterial cells so there's that interface delivers the nutrients that's the that's where the that's how this thing works we have a a model for this and if you look at the top right you kind of see that same image that i showed actually below now of that head but now you see red bacteria drawn in for the the little red balls for the bacteria and you can see the trichome cells in the center. And you see an exchange now, carbon goes out, that sugar goes out to the microbes, but the microbes push nitrogen, provide nitrogen, put antioxidant nitrogen back in, in, uh, in order to counteract that superoxide. And, and of course the, nit nit the trichome cells themselves can absorb that nitrate that forms uh, in the reaction between oxide and superoxide. So uh, that's how we think that the glandular trichome is working. Uh, there, are, there are lots of unanswered questions. Uh, and uh, for example, uh, we know that these tr glandular trichomes are sources of chemicals. And uh, in cannabis, for example, uh, the terpenoids, cannabinoids produced inside those glandular trichomes. So do, do these interactions in the hemp trichome impact on those cannabinoids. And, and what about hops? Uh, hops also is in that same family. Hops, very similar. Uh, uh, and I think I'll talk about that pretty soon, but uh, most likely those cannabinoids are affected. And uh, the reason for that is that in fact, the cannabinoids themselves may be what the plant is using as an antioxidant inside those in, antioxidants inside those trichomes. Uh, the the terpenoids, terp, terpenoids are antioxidants. They've been shown to have antioxidant effects. I put some articles down there uh, just so you can see that. But there's a lot of a lot of data that says that these are uh, THC and similar cannab cannabinoids uh, or, or, or other terpenoids inside hairs have are potent antioxidants. And uh, in fact, they are rare antioxidants in that they, they uh, don't have nitrogen in their structure. So this is a kind of antioxidant that uh, does not have a, a nitrogen cost. A lot of alkaloids that could be produced would have alkaloids would require nitrogen and that would have a cost in terms of nitrogen. But 
inside these trichomes, uh, the terpenoids are uh, antioxidants that have no nitrogen cost. So it's only photosynthate, no nitrogen. So that'd be ideal for a system that's trying to maximize efficiency of nitrogen extraction from these nitrogen fixing microbes. They said a mouthful, there's a lot that has to be tested there. Uh, but you can see what we're, what we're working on, what we're trying to figure out. Uh, this is hops. You can see the hops, uh, these little hops fruits are where all the, all the, uh, all the uh, glandular trichomes are. That's a close up of a hops glandular trichome. See the arrows there. See the bacteria inside, inside those just exactly the same way we saw in, the, in cannabis. And there you see it. This is stained for nitrate. And you can see on the hops, you can see that there's, it's full of microbes, hard to see, but you can see all the purple compared to the other epidermal cells. That's all nitrate stain. It's all nitrate. These are filled with organs. Here's a tree of heaven. These are different trichomes. These are, these are uh, they cover the leaves like this, but they're also full of microbes. And this actually shows one of those tree of heaven microbes. You can see some microbes coming out, forming there. They're coming out from the inter interior of those. Uh, there you can see this is a bacillus coming out of this one. But they mostly stay in, so don't get the don't get the wrong idea that these are all just to come out for the surface. Mostly these stay in these trichomes and function in the trichomes. Uh, maybe when they get old, they come out. But when is it functional? They they so do endophytes affect chemical composition of plants? We did a study on carrot. Had a student taking microbes off of different plants, bacterium one, bacterium two, bacterium three from different, one from celery, one from curcumin, one from parsley, and then put it onto carrot. And then my students, you see the bacteria now in the carrot root hairs there on the carrot. And there you can see bacteria in just to see what it looks like. And then my student measured the, the carotenoids in the carrot with and without the various microbes. And you can see the control here. This is with no microbes. You can see this much carotene versus bacterium one. It's about the same. That, that bacterium probably didn't have any effect at all. Then you see bacterium two, you can see it had a big effect. It went inside and greatly increased the alpha carotenes. Bacterium three, not as much. So one of those was highly effective at increasing. Here, here's the beta carotenes. It looks very similar. You can see that bacterium two increased it. Bacterium one just had no effect, and bacterium three at minimal. So depending on the endophyte, you can change the chemical components in plants. Uh, the endophytes also increase stress tolerance in plants, and they do that because they're having this interaction in the plants, and that's causing plants to upregulate their oxidative resistance because they're, they're, the plant themselves are producing the superoxide. So now it needs to... Uh, uh, in order to, uh, it needs to be more resistant to that superoxide so that it increases its antioxidants and whatever other mechanisms it has to protect itself from its own oxidants like superoxide that forms inside. Okay, so uh, whenever an endophyte is present, you see this oxidative stress enhancement. Okay, and this shows this shows one. This is actually. Uh, some experiments, an experiment from the experiment that uh, Leslie Rodriguez here did in which they showed a fungal endophyte made their plants more resistant to salt stress. And you can see here, uh, the ones to the right, they call symbiotic is where they put, they put a, a fungal endophyte in there, in their plant, and then they put it in salt, salt soil. And you can see these, these latter three are the, the later three, these other, these, Outer three are the salt ones. And, and, and then they compared that to non-symbiotic without bacteria. And you can see that these three salt ones are not doing very well without that endocyte. And that, that is an oxidative, we think is oxidative protection effect because that's not, salt is an oxidative stress. So here's heat stress, same deal. Here they, they, they looked at some thermic soils soils that were really hot, uh, in which the temperature was up to 60 or 70 degrees uh, centigrade. I think, I think it was very, very hot, very, very hot. Not boiling, but really hot, nearly boiling soils. 
And, and the one picture to the left shows the plants with their fungal endophyte, and to the right shows the plants without. And you can see that made a big difference having the endophyte presence. Present. The endophytes also protect plants from disease. They'll do that a couple of different ways. They'll actually go out of, from the plant and colonize pathogens and make them to be non-pathogenic. They will also uh, cause the plants to be more, to be hardier and less susceptible to disease because of this oxidative stress uh, enhancement that you get. Okay, and this just shows from one experiment, uh, shows actually with uh, English ivy with an endophyte, you see there's no disease there from just the same experiment. You see without the endophyte, you see there's disease all over it. Okay, so this is, this protection uh, has been referred to as a, like a bodyguard hypothesis. The endophyte is guarding its host, guarding the body of its host using chemicals or whatever means it has to protect its host. This has also been called defensive mutualism concept by Keith Clay with fungal endophytes in particular, the idea that plants are taking in these endophytes as a way to defend themselves, them, themselves from uh, herbivory, for example, or from uh, stressful conditions or whatever the, the concept would still work there. So you have all of these potential benefits of microbes in plants. I think I think the take home message that I want you to have is that plants are taking in soil microbes on a routine basis for nutrients, but also for help them to develop better, uh, to resist stressful conditions, to combat disease. So it would make sense for us to develop an agriculture in which we are trying to support what plants do in terms of how they use microbes, then work against the system by putting on, for example, inorganic forms of nitrogen or something that we know will paralyze the system uh, or surface disinfect seeds. You know, we know that seeds carry microbes on the fort microbes for the plant. So uh, I mean, we should be trying to support plant activities with microbes as opposed to working against it. So these are some papers uh, that, that we did that are open access and they have bits of the science in it and that you're, uh, they're all free. You can get to, get, uh, but they'll, they'll fill, fill in more details than you ever wanted to know. The, Trichome stuff is not in it. So everything you heard today about the trichomes is, uh, is brand new. Not very many people have heard it. We're, it's an active research project we're working on, part of, part of uh, my April Michi's PhD project that she's been working on for three and a half for many, many years now. So I think I'm good for any questions. Oh, that was wonderful, James. Thanks so much. The, Thank you. The new information about the trichomes, that's so fun um, to wrap our heads around and to really think about how complete um, the microbiome of a plant is and how, um, you know, how everything we do as growers really impacts that. So it's really really great to have you um, bring that new information to us. Um, we do have some questions and so I'll go through those and uh, please everyone, if you have more questions, just pop them in the Q&A and then I've got some questions too. I know we're, um, we'll, we'll run up against time but we'll just see what we can do. Okay, so Roger Weiss asks, um, what is the frequency of rhizophagy versus the more common rhizosphere well-described relationship where plants attract specific microbes with root exudates and the microbes that produce or make available nutrients to the plant uh, that the plant absorbs. So root exudation to attract microbes and nutrient cycling versus rhizophagy? Yeah, so they're, they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, rhizophagy was happening all the time. You know, people, while people didn't see it 
happening. It was, it was going on. And so some subset of nutrients that we all assumed is coming out of the soil in soil solution is not coming in soil solution. It's coming in the microbes themselves. It is, it is, it's a, an overlooked piece of, of how plants get nutrients. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's the best that I could say. Uh, it, 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 it does differ. It seems like, it seems like, wow, how could we miss something like this? Well, the, how could we miss something like that? It's because we have our ideas already mm -hmm. clear in our heads about what is going on. And every one since third, third grade science, you know, when we're learning plant biology and how roots absorb nutrients into their root hairs from the soil, when I mean, we never forget that lesson and that mm -hmm. lesson, that lesson we carry with us and it paints everything that we do with plants. You know? Right. And, and so if it's wrong or it's incomplete, we're, we're, we don't know. You know, we can't, we can't, we can't tell. Now that we know, okay, now the trick is, and it's, it's a very difficult trick, but I mean, we've been trying to do it. It's now separating out, you know, only the nutrients that come in soil solution, only the nutrients that come through, uh, with, that are being oxidized with superoxide, you know, which ones require that system now. Uh, but, then, but, then, but then it's all complexed because uh, what happens when you have the microbes there, they make the roots grow more. And you're gonna have, because the roots grow more, you're gonna have more microbes there. Mm -hmm. And your exudation is gonna be more. So you're gonna have more microbes on the outside too. So it, it's hard sorting it all out, but you could, in theory at least, design experiments in which you could separate out nutrients absorbed because of growth. Mm. You know, and just look at those that are associated with, say, oxidative effects on plants. But it's going to depend on my, on the microbe you use because they're different microbes mm -hmm. and they have different features. So, yeah, so sorting it out is not going to be easy, but it could it, 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 it could be done. Yeah. So it was all they were it was always there. Rhizophagy was always happening. It's still happening. And so some of the rhizophagy nutrient uh, cycling or providing of those nutrients by the endophytes might have been clumped into that passive transport, mass flow. And yes. so do you yes. think that those yes. nutrients that are provided through the, yes. um, the, in, you know, the rhizophagy cycle, would they like the nitrogen the N15, N14, would there be different isotopes that can be tracked, whether it was provided via, you know, you know, soil applied soluble nutrient through passive um, transport or? You could, you could. I think, I, I actually think that, I mean, now, now that you raise the issue of faith of nitrogen, 15 of isotopic nitrogen tracking. What I would like to see, the experiment that I would like to see would be exposure of trichomes, of leaves with trichomes on them at, to short bursts of, of, of 15N nitrogen, right? And then analysis of, of the 15N that went into the trichome itself versus the hairs. I mean, the hairs themselves, the trichomes themselves versus the leaf itself. And this could be, this actually could be done uh, because a plant like hairy mullein, I don't know if you're familiar, verbascum thapsis, you're great weed, yeah. great weed. Yeah, I love it. Does, does not like nitrogen at all. Does not mm -hmm. like, it's, it is, it is but, but it is filled, the leaves are covered with these branching trichomes that just keep branching like this just like a network and so uh we could do what we could do the beauty of that is but we can separate off the trichome layer from the leaf layer just by rubbing it off mm -hmm. and so then we can analyze what goes into the trichome versus what goes in then to the leaf and then we could track you know the movement from the trichome into the leaf and 
like that. I mean, that's the experiment. That's the experiment that, that we want to do to track this, to track it better. We, we, honestly, the breakthrough came when uh, we were looking at, at staining bacteria in root hairs to try to figure out what interactions are happening. Mm -hmm. Because when we're able to take a chemical equation you know, and link it to something that the microbe and the plant are doing, you know, it, things seem more concrete. And then we could just track the chemical stains you know, through other plant tissues to see, to see how that could happen. So that's what we're, that's what we're doing. Cool. But, yeah, yeah, so anyways, yes. I'm Thank gonna you. try to get through some of these. Yeah. We have 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, uh, Liz Joseph is hosting a meet and greet for the um, soil and nutrition um, conference attendees at, um, I'm at 4.45, uh, my time, Liz, is that gonna be 5.45? I know the link is in 4.45. Um, it's in the email that you were sent out uh, earlier today. And it's also on the conference, the soil and nutrition conference um, website. Uh, page. And so please join us for a conversation, meet your fellow attendees. And yep, that's Eastern time. Okay, 445 Eastern time. Um, okay, so Tom Wiley asks, um, a USA or a USC Davis um, soil ecologist told me that though rhizophagy uh, is a real phenomenon, in the case of agronomic crops, that's a, that's a selective choice there. Um, its contribution to total nutrient uh, is rather insufficient. Do you have evidence to the contrary? Uh, I don't know how he got that number. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know where that comes from. Okay, um, so Roger yeah. Weiss has another question. Roger, thank you for your questions, they're awesome. Um, are endophytes uh, promiscuous or is there a specific plant microbe relationship? Yeah, there. Uh, some of them can go uh, quite a quite a bit between plants uh, and stimulate most of those plants. There, there are some though that when you put them in another plant, they inhibit the plant, and it, and we think it has to do with uh, oxidative susceptibility in the microbe. That it, that for example, that Micrococcus luteus that I talked about it produces uh, superoxide and it will produce some other, uh, uh, it also, uh, it'll produce some other kinds of antioxidants that enables it to resist plant superoxide when, mm. it's, when it's placed in some other plant. So it can actually inhibit, like for example, we can take that one from tomato and we can put it in uh, Japanese uh, invasive plant, uh, uh, Japanese well, knotweed. Knotweed, Japanese knotweed, for example. Yeah, put it in that and it inhibits the roots completely. Mm. Uh, so we, yeah, we use some of those as a, we use it as a, a bioherbicidal uh, effects. And so we're actually working on using some of these things, uh, developing some bioherbicides that are kind of endophyte based. And uh, so some of those are, are used in that kind of a, a bioherbicide stuff that we're working that, on. It's really, really cool stuff. That's a wormhole I would love it, to- It's do. another wormhole. It's another yeah. wormhole. We, yeah. just, we just did a patent on that. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's I really interesting. Care. Turn yeah. into fights, turn into fights into pathogens and kill the plant. That's the, that's the nut. That's the nut on that. That's the whole goal. And so we put a patent out uh, how you do that. It's like the endo endo uh, the insect endo endo yeah, fungi endo it, it, it is it is now where you can where they're, they're normally symbiotic in there and helpful mm -hmm. but but if we provide them arginine they take the microbes will take the arginine and they will produce more ethylene so they'll overproduce ethylene and then that ethylene ages the plant it ages the plant. It ages the plant, causes stress in the plant, causes stress plants to die prematurely. So that's the that's the way it that's the way it is. Yeah. Wow. Isn't that cool? That's so cool. Isn't that cool? Oh my goodness. Yeah. And well, I want to see how yeah. it works in nature naturally because if we're yeah. figuring it out, it just right. means that it's actually happening right. in nature. Right. 
Yeah. Okay, so a couple more questions. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Z says, how much of plant, plant nitrogen uh, needs can be plant nitrogens? Okay, let me start over. How much of a plant's nitrogen needs can a plant get through breaking down the proteins from the microbes it absorbs? Um, all of its needs or a certain percentage? So the, the maximum number that I have seen comes from a couple of different experiments and it's 33% uh, using grasses, mm -hmm. using grasses. Now, is that, do I think that's a maximum? I do not think that's mm -hmm. a maximum. I've got a friend who's uh, trying to, uh, uh, Walter Goldstein at Mandaman Institute, some of you may know him, trying to breed corn, uh, organic corn that has nitrogen fixing microbes in it. So we're trying to help him to do that. And we can see the microbes that he's breeding into the corn and, it, and it's having effects on, on root structure, but it also appears to be increasing root hair, uh, trichome length in some of the some of the corn. So we're so we're looking, we're trying to look closely at that to see if there's any correlation there with the, you know, his enhanced nitrogen fixation in his plants and like more activity in trichomes. Every answer yeah. you get, every answer you give, I want to ask well, it is, it is it is it is this thing. I mean it goes back to this. Uh, we don't provide plants nitrogen in nature. You know, I mean this is what we do in organic you know, in, in our production systems, you know, we've made plants now that you know, we put them in systems where we feed them mostly with inorganic nitrogen and, and uh, in soils that has few microbes in it. And, uh, you know, they don't sustain very well on their own, but if you take, you know, the plants that they came from, the ancestors of those plants, and you look where they grow in nature, they don't need any of that mm. stuff to live. They live perfectly fine on their own without any kind of fertilizers added to them. Plants have their systems. And, you know, if we don't, if we don't know those systems are there, then we just ignore it, right? We don't know, we do what we're doing. We think our, our ideas are right about it. And we, you know, it's all, it's all chemical, you know, it's all chemical. So we just keep putting chemicals on. Okay, but if we have some other, things, some other way of thinking about them, you know, the, so we realize that these are net, they have their own systems and then we can start to figure out what those are and figure out, you know, to what benefit, you know, the microbial process really is for plants. But I, but I think that the answer is going to be, uh, it's a fundamental benefit to plants because if you take away those microbes, those plants do, are not, they do not grow well at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not a matter, this is not a, a, a like a casual thing. I mean, we can, I, mean, I, I don't think I need to even say anything more about it. Go ahead, yeah. go ahead, go ahead. Oh, well, I actually just want to invite you if you're willing and yeah. no pressure at all. We're having a breakout session after this, um, after this soil and nutrition conference session. Um, everyone, if you want to check that out, all the links are in the chat. Um, I personally have a million questions for you, James, but I think that's probably not unusual. <laughs> and well, we have many and, questions here as well. Um, and we have just two more minutes, so I could ask a few more questions unless you have okay, some ask, Okay, ask. all right. Um, so Luis asks, or Lewis asks about the Hackberry experiment. Um, if you've been on the rooftop, then that might be from Matt Powers, um, uh, yes. podcast. Yes. Um, he was wondering um, what species of Celtis and do you have any notes, index files, um, any um, bibliography for that roof, rooftop experiment um, for the Soilless Media? Are you building? So, so we did not set that experiment up. Those are all volunteer plants on the roof of this building. And uh, I've been visiting them during the pandemic on a regular basis. So I could see them and monitoring them. And it's amazing. They have no soil at all. You know, this, this, uh, these plants, uh, Joe Pye weed is one of them, the Celtis oxidentalis, the, the, the hackberry, right? Oxidentalis, Celtis oxidentalis. 
uh, there's there's a wild uh, there's some other wild uh, um, uh, plants that are up there that are like the thapsus the 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 hairy mullein that I talked about it's up there too growing with no soil and mm. uh, you know those are plants that they obviously you know you can't say that uh, they're getting any at least no applied nitrogen they're getting maybe they're getting pollutant forms of nitrogen just coming into the air the dust particles that wash off of the building or whatever but you can't see any soil accumulation there mm. they're they're growing without soil. a lot of plants do that you know agaves in the desert you see them sometimes dangling from the cliffside with a hanging by a root you know mm. and still doing fine you know they're nature of life to grow it is, it is, they will grow. Yeah. They have their systems, they have their ways. Mm -hmm. And that's what, and that's what we have to do, you know, stop, you know, step away from our science for a little bit of our, everything we know already that we learned for a long time ago, and then start looking with new eyes and see, well, okay, these microbes are in there. Let's see what really they're doing. You know, mm -hmm. let's do some experiments. Let's see how much plants really rely on them you know, stuff like that, you know, so, and that's going to take a lot more than just my lab. Yes. Know? Yeah. Yeah. James, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing uh, all of your information around rhizophagy cycle and also sharing the new information around the um, phylosphere uh, cycle. What will you call that? I don't know. I have, I have, I, I haven't, it's, it's not cyclic to me, so I have thought of not <laughs> calling it a cycle, but uh, it, it does seem like it could be something important. Mm -hmm. You know, it does seem important from a number of perspectives. I mean, for one thing, trichomes have these bacteria in them. So, mm -hmm. and if they're important sources of other chemicals, then what do these microbes do? I mean, so you could go down the line uh, and find reasons that it's important to to look at these trichome microbes endophytes a bit more closely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Well, again, open invite if you want to join after okay. this session. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. And we look forward to uh, being with you next week. And we'll all just continue building on this knowledge. Have a great day.